Hey, John. It's so nice seeing you again. I was explaining a little bit to my students of what you do, um, but I'll let that, I'll let you do that. I'll let you do introduce yourself and just give a little spiel. Sure. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is John Tai, and I'm an industrial designer, and I run uh, two companies. I run a design consultancy called Haps Duo. Uh, here in Santa Clara, and then I also own and run a watch lifestyle brand business called Aggregate Watches. And yeah, I just feel really uh, humbled to talk to you guys today, and I just feel really uh, glad that Victoria invited me to speak to you guys a little bit about um, CMF. And uh, I, I will definitely disclose that I'm by no means the the expert on it, but I have some some tidbits of, of knowledge that I think that I could share with you guys as, as students and um, hopefully that'll be of value to you. Um, I just thought I'd keep this really like nice and light and fun and you know playing on Hatch Duo's branding I decided to give you guys uh, a dozen tips on CMF design and how it kind of relates to uh, product design and industrial design and in some ways kind of branding too. So what is CMF and why does it matter? Um, so in, in my mind, I think, you know, color, material, and finish, it's, it's easy to delineate that, that acronym, you know, those, those three letters. But for designers, it's a real strategic and tactical step that allows designers to communicate who the brand is for, um, how the product is used, and market positioning. And like, what does that all mean, right? Like, when you're out in the professional world and you're you're actually going about and using design for business, um, that's where it really comes into play. And I think um, for me, um, in a very crowded marketplace like consumer electronics, for instance, brand really uh, means everything, and it's a way where you can distinguish and differentiate yourself. And so, uh, depending on how you strategically apply color, material, and finish, uh, it really really can convey to your customer um, who this is for and can possibly help um, that brand, you know, sell through more units of the product or um, just get buy-in from uh, a certain customer base for to basically increase your tribe, right? And so I like to think of CMF as the first impression of a brand. And so just like when you meet someone or you interview someone for the very first time, how they dress, uh, although like we don't want to say it, and sometimes it's trivial, it does give you an impression of of that person right off the bat. And so, um, Hatch Duo particularly works with a lot of startups, and we really emphasize um, having a proper branding CMS strategy, um, especially if they're kind of a new brand coming out of the gates and um, trying to basically carve their market share. Um, CMF can communicate affordances, right? So you guys are probably learning about, if you've read some of those books that you're assigned in your, your courses, um, they can communicate affordances and visual cues on how a product is used. So brands and companies always want to feel that their products are premium, expensive, and high quality, right? That's an example. So CMF is a strategy that can be applied with proper knowledge, proper knowledge of materials and processes to achieve. So an example would be, you know, if, if you want something to look very premium, then perhaps you could um, apply a panel that is aluminum with a brush finish and that, you know, in itself strategically says, hey, this is something nicer, um, this is something a little bit more premium. If you can learn to utilize CMF as a strategy, you'll be in really good territory to monetize that skill. And what I mean is like I've seen and I know colleagues that specialize purely in this, like, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not into doing the CAD work, they're not into doing like necessarily the sketching, but the design research and understanding the, the thinking behind positioning, the selection of your materials, your colors and your finishes, that's a very monetizable skill. Um, as a design firm, you can build this into your offering and have it be a large source of revenue. Um, we do that ourselves. Um, and you know, just for you guys who eventually will be graduating, 
uh, you know, we've hired freelancers and specialists that charge, you know, 5K to 10K per engagement. And that's like for a one to two week engagement of just helping us with CMF. So you can make some decent money um, just kind of uh, niching down and, and focusing in this realm. Um, CMF may be one of the last things decided, but many times the first impression of a product. So make sure it conveys what you want to say about the brand. And, uh, you know, I, I figured, you know, you guys might want to know like money wise, like, because you guys obviously are studying industrial design for a career someday. So, um, if you decide to specialize in CMF, I looked up the data for it. So, uh, I think, you know, if you were to graduate, the average annually is $67,000 per year, but in the SF Bay area, obviously the cost of living is way more expensive. So the salaries are a lot higher. So it's about 75 K annually to start. And obviously as you guys move up, you can and will make over a six figure amount. And that's if you work for someone and if you decide to run your own business, then obviously you could get up in the ranges of seven or eight figures even, right? Um, and there's a number of design firms who specifically focus a lot on the front end of branding and strategy and CMF. So um, that might be interesting to you guys and that, you know, just like within medicine, there's different focuses. Um, and then CMF is advantageous at the production level for design, um, especially at the verification testing level, um, because, you know, in order to help with suggestions of materials and processes and secondary processes, you're, you're, you're basically looking at like all these things that need to be done engineering wise, tooling wise, manufacturing wise, but you're using kind of your, your smarts and your, your knowledge of, of how those materials and finishes can be applied, or at least, faked even because sometimes there's things such as in mold decoration that can make something look like metal but it's not actually metal but because the client or the company that you're working for may want it to you know be perceived a certain way then that knowledge base is going to help your kind of your your arsenal for you know tackling getting that thing through production the way you want um mold tech and Yik Sang are great texture books. As the I'm on hand for you guys to like reference, but um, we have those in my studio, and in the studios I've worked with before, and companies I've worked with before, like they have those, and you know it's basically like you know a Pantone booklet, but it's for textures, right? And so um, a lot of that's going to be very important down the line when you guys start to get things into production. Um, Pantone PMS standards are, are a great um, baseline, but I would highly recommend that you don't just rely on that for color. Um, definitely go out into the real world when this virus is over and, and get real world examples, bandsaw swatches and set up your own sample sheets. Um, especially when you're working with factories, that's, I find like that's a really uh, good way to work because they have, you know, a lot of times the factories will have um, you know, spectrum scanners. And so they'll be able to like scan the exact color that, that you want. When you're annotating it, you know, uh, Pantone chips are a good baseline. Um, CMF is traditionally applied in the later stages of design. But again, like I suggest the hatch duo way to think about it, which is very, very early on before you even start to design the form or you know, even talk about, you know, what this product requires feature wise, just really try to understand the brand and the strategy behind the brand. Um, and then you're able to kind of give you some guiding principles of color, material and finish, as well as just like visual language and visual ingredients that will help kind of drive the overall design process. And so at Hatch Duo, we, we definitely practice that. Um, Color is good for first reads. So if you think of, you know, um, looking at an object with three reads, the first read being, you know, kind of a, a 10 to 20 foot view, and then the second read being like a, a five to three foot view, and the third read being like when you're looking up super close at it. 
Um, color is really good for the first read um, for touch, you know, touch point identifiers. So if you look at um, hardware tools, you'll see that, you know, they color their handles or their color buttons and things of that nature. So, you know, that's some good tips for you guys as you design your, your projects. Um, and then, you know, the next tip would be finish choices, textures are great to use for third read interaction. And it really kind of like sets you up, uh, sets you above the competition in terms of if you can really understand, you know, it's not just glossy matte or satin. You actually can get in and look at a product and actually figure out, you know, the, the nuanced identity of it just based on, you know, how it feels, right? Because like, aside from looking at something, that touch is, is a super important part of the, the interaction. Um, and then also just thinking about how texture affects photography and rendering. And so um, in my last probably uh, five years of, of being an industrial designer, I've been heavily involved in art direction for photography as well. And so I'm always thinking about like what, you know, what texture is going to be applied on that surface? Like, how is it going to look? How is, how is lighting going to like, you know, shape that curve? How is that going to be on, you know, the surface, et cetera? So um, just really start to think about those kinds of details and your stuff will look great at the end. Um, and then lastly, I think my, my final tip, and if, if it's the one thing you guys get out of my talk, it's to go out in the real world and observe things. I know we're doing things digitally right now because it's not safe, um, but, you know, don't let digital tools uh, dissuade you from getting out and experiencing and touching and looking at things, you know, with your real eyes. And I think that's going to make you guys better designers in the long run. What has the impact of like your knowledge in manufacturing processes and the materials you're working with? How, what, what big of an impact has it made on your design process and your design thinking over time? Yeah, I think it's, for me, it's like opened up a lot more of possibility as opposed to just, I think it's gonna look like this, but I have no idea how to make that happen. It's allowed me to push back a lot on, um, like I said, you have to navigate a lot of different stakeholders. And so a lot of a lot of times it's, it's at the manufacturing and production level. And at that level, you're gonna get a lot of uh, pushback for people who don't want to push the boundaries of for instance the concrete right like and so you'll because you know as you arm yourself with knowledge knowledge is power then you can basically show them a path of how they can do it and maybe it's harder for them or takes more work for them to do it but at least if you can show them that that's the possibility then you can basically start to push the fringes of what um what has been and then what is like new so that's how you come up with new stuff right yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. It's wonderful seeing you. Thank you for sharing Great this with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. You guys stay safe out there. Thank Absolutely you. Absolutely, too. Enjoy your week. All right. Thank you.